here is Mail Online. September the 28th, schoolgirl 14 dies and three classmates taken ill after being given new cervical cancer vaccine. It's getting monotonous, isn't it? And even though it's monotonous, mind you, being the new Soviet system they are under governance, they'll keep at it and at it and at it regardless of facts. They love to try to smash square pegs into round holes. A 14-year-old schoolgirl died hours after being given the controversial cervical cancer vaccine today. A teenager from Blue Coat Church of England School in Coventry died in hospital after receiving the cervarix jab. The tragedy marks the first reported death, no, she's not the first, since more than 1.5 million doses of the injection were given to young girls as part of the national vaccination program since last September in the UK. A number of her classmates have reported side effects to the vaccine. Critics say their case highlights the risk of mass vaccination because no testing regime can ever pick up the rarest and potentially most lethal side effects. Now, how they rationalize this at the top is how you do it under socialist governments, where they say uh, the maximum good for the greatest number. That's their policy for everything. If you happen to be in the minority of a slightly different physiology or whatever, then you're an acceptable write-off. Literally, you're an acceptable write-off. doesn't matter how many hundreds of them there are, thousands, you're an acceptable write-off. So you look at the rest, they're okay. Mind you, the rest won't show the symptoms right away until years down the roads, like bursting out in cancers all over and different things like that. Sterility, of course, is a favorite amongst elite pharma companies, and you'll see that happening down the roads. But these are the ones who get bumped off quickly, and that's called acceptable risk under socialism. That's how it is. Not difficult to understand. And uh, here's from Time Knots, Mark Bard's Time Knots. I'll put all these links up on my site at the end of the show, cutting through matrix.com. And this is from September the 25th, 2009. It says, uh, this is a huge and historic, uh, the first attempted mass vaccination to be rejected by the masses. Even parents planning to get their children the seasonal flu vaccine will say no to the swine flu jab. German spring school children are expected to be the focus of a massive U.S. vaccination campaign against the novel H1N1 flu. So this ties in with the Los Angeles report. But if their parents are hearing the round cry to have their children vaccinated, they're not buying it since the new national survey. And that's again, that's the University of Michigan's uh, C.S. Mott Children's Hospital edu- uh, survey that they did. And 40% said they would get their children immunized against the H1N1 virus. And it says 54 indicated they would get their children vaccinated against the regular seasonal flu. And it's pretty well verbatim from the previous one that I read. The word's got to get out there to people because there'll be a lot of side effects of this. And something stinks. As I say, this is a mild flu if it even exists at all outside of the media. I think that's the only place it truly exists, to be honest with you. And that happened with the last swine flu. But outside the media, it didn't exist. And once the media stopped talking about it, guess what? It, it was gone. And I think this, this stinks when they go to such amazing lengths to get something into our bloodstreams. Incredible lens to get something into our bloodstreams for something that's very mild or doesn't exist at all. Something really stinks, especially when every other person who's been trained in medicine agrees that this vaccine is of no use for the mild flu because if it mutates into the killer they're talking about, you need a vaccine specifically designed for the killer one that hasn't broken out. It's, it's quite something. Eh? Now, farmers too. Remember, food in warfare, you go after food and water first of all. That's what they did in ancient times to the present. In total war scenarios as we have today, and the U.S. has shown what they did in Iraq, they go after what they call infrastructure. That's your wells, that's um, food plants, that's farming areas, even poison them if need be. That's what you do. And even over in Afghanistan, when the Soviets were doing the job of trying to annihilate them over there, they put cyanide in their water supplies. They even made movies about it. And um, I don't think it stopped today with our boys, because our boys are good boys. See, warfare is warfare, and their object is to win by any means possible. And in total warfare, all the population are fair game. But 
under warfare, it's food and water primarily. And we have watched, let's say, mainly since World War II, the farmers having restrictions put on them one after another until thousands and thousands of farmers in Canada, the U.S., and Britain, and across Europe were put under, put under by red tape from government agencies. That was intentional and as part of long-term strategy. Long-term strategy. Because under this new socialist world UN system we're going into, they have to be in charge of all foodstuffs, but they'll still be in the hands of the five big agri-food businesses that almost control all of it today. And there'll be no choices in what you eat. It's whatever you're given. In fact, the UN has said the Department of Agriculture will be responsible when they get lifted up to their proper status as a part of the world government. They will dish out to every region, they call it regions, these conglomerates like the American region, the European region and so on, they'll dish out the food to every region and it will be rationed and part of the reason for it will be to for you to force your own populations down inside those, those regions and you know darn well it'll start off at a certain limit, limit then they'll say well we don't have enough food this year so there's a bigger ration you have to find ways of dealing with your population problem, I guarantee you you're, you're going to live through seeing this and then you have the Council on Foreign Relations own website where they've had whole teams working for about 15, 20 years on the coming food shortages. They just knew it was going to happen. Why? Because all the big members are part of these big businesses and agribusinesses that run the world's food supply. And they'll make it happen. That's why. And now they're whacking the, 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 the farmers, not only with oh, E. coli and your cattle and all the rest of it, but being resp they're responsible for letting carbon into the atmosphere. Now, here's an article... It's actually a pro, getting an idea, a carbon credit article. And it's from the Des Moines Register. It's, um, it says here by, uh, I didn't see who it is. Tim Kaldenberg, who farms in Monroe County, already participates in a carbon credit program started by the Iowa Farm Bureau. Kaldenberg earns credits for 410 acres of land, some of which he farms without tillage, and the rest he seeded to grass. Those two practices store carbon in the soil, since is the theory, you see. Utilities and other companies that want to offset their carbon emissions can buy credits from farmers such as Kaldenberg. But without regulations on carbon yet, the credits have little value. Kaldenberg's last payment was $50. There's also questions about whether existing contracts such as Kaldenberg's would qualify under a pending climate bill. Whether he and other farmers get involved in offset projects in the future will depend on how much it costs to comply with the program Congress enacts, he said. Such a program will include some regulations to verify that farmers are doing what their contracts require. In other words, they're telling them, you see, if they just sit there and grow grass and don't farm it and grow food, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Do you know how many farmers there are across the whole world right now who are getting paid by their governments, including Canada, not to grow stuff? It's been that for years. You think they can't create a food shortage? Of course they can create it. They're in the process of doing it. And they want meat eliminated completely under this new world religion to bring in. After all, people who are healthy and think a lot are a danger to society. So meat will be banned and phased out. It already is getting put up, up to incredible prices. And every one of the green giants, the jolly green giants like Al Gore and all the rest of them, have said that. Oh, it's so, it's so energy intensive to, to raise cattle that they'll have to be phased out. Then you're left with Monsanto's heavily uh, pesticide-laced GMO products and we're supposed to live in this happy cancerous utopia. Amazing what we are swallow, isn't it? So this was uh, some kind of... And they all say this with straight faces, carbon credits. A, a complete abstract nonsense, carbon credits. Complete bogus abstract nonsense that is to be the whole economy. That's what they're telling us in all the other articles in, on the, the newspapers. This is to be the global economy. And what does it do? Right down to the personal level, you are going to be a slave as you pay and pay and pay for every mouth of food you eat, everything you wear, everything you buy, it's going to be, you're going to be whacked with carbon taxes because that's the carbon. They will tell you, these experts with their slide rules and guesses and fingers in the air, 
they really tell you how much carbon it took the energy to make that product and you're bad for having it all 